a Nigeria representative of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, Nadine Bosa, has disclosed that the organization is ready to scale up its intervention in the Nigerian agricultural sector. Bosa, who spoke shortly after visiting IFAD, supported Aliad rice processing mill in Gwer East local government area of Beno State, where the intervention has transformed production processes at the facility at the end of the VCDP2 project identification meeting held in Makadi, said it was left to the federal government to have the intervention scaled up. I am now joined by the senior special assistant to the president, Muhammad Buhari Ajuri Ngalali. Good morning, Mr. Ngalali. Yes, good morning to you. All right, thanks for joining us. Now, for a long time, we have heard that agriculture is Africa's gold. And some of us heard stories of the glory days of the granite uh, pyramids and the coconut, cocoa mounds. Uh, you know, why is it taking us so long to reclaim our rightful place as the global agricultural messiahs, if we put it that way? Uh, thank you so much. Well, I think uh, it's a very important question. You have uh, essentially a, a, a decades-long trend that is now being reversed. And to reverse something that has been in place over now generations, where we allowed most of our agricultural value chains to just fall off the table, for example, cotton is a very good example, where for several decades now, you remember in the 1980s, outside of the civil service, uh, you know, uh, the cock, uh, cotton production uh, and uh, milling of, of, you know, all processing of cotton uh, into textiles, etc. Textiles was the second biggest uh, job creating vehicle in the country. Of course, we saw that fall off uh, in the post 1980s. So for us now, when you're talking about 35, 40 years, reviving some of these value chains, what you have to deal with is orientation. You know, people really kind of having the idea that white collar is the way to go. Our parents tell our children in this country for the most part that if you're not a lawyer, you're not a journalist, you're not an accountant, you're not a medical doctor, you're not a scientist, uh, then you're really not where you need to be. So we have to change our orientation from the family level and then, of course, uh, encourage our young people to say, you know what, there are opportunities in agriculture in terms of wealth creation that simply are not existent uh, in, 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 in other sectors. And it's because of the, the, the policy innovations that have been brought to bear uh, by Mr. President in terms of uh, cutting fertilizer, the price of fertilizer in half to enhance profits, to ensure that we, we provide low interest facilities to our farmers and producers uh, from the CBM and so many other interventions that have been made. So it's, it's going to be a process, but certainly under the president's uh, administration, uh, there has been a lot of changes and we have seen the fruit of those changes. All right. Ngalala, you mentioned uh, young people there coming on board. What what needs to be done to make agriculture, you know, attractive enough for young people to be happy to begin to look into that direction? Well, you have to create the enabling environment, uh, number, number one. I, I think for us now, it's very, very critical to say, look, yes, we have done well over the last five years in terms of import substitution, whereas we were essentially a wholly dependent import economy before, from toothpicks to rice to wheat. We were spending $3 billion a year on rice importation. We have now gotten to the point where we have substituted that uh, up to about 97% now uh, so with local production. And that's as a result of the policies of, of this administration. So for us, we now need to go to the next level and, and go from import substitution to now export dependency, you know, so th that's the key uh, over this over this second term. And the way we do that is making sure that we create the opportunities for our young people uh, with the new programs that we're bringing on stream. Mm -hmm. Now, l let's talk about agriculture a little bit more. Did it really need to take COVID-19 for us as a nation to wake up to the unsustainability of a mono economy? Well, I think that's a great misperception is, you know, because, yes, we're talking about economic stimulus and all of that. There's an idea that, you know, that we haven't done all we can up to this point. And that, that wouldn't be correct. Uh, we have done all we can. The difference and the reason why we say that there is opportunity in this moment of crisis is that it, it, it unifies and gathers a political consensus so that we have the political will of all stakeholders, right? So, for example, now, National Assembly is prepared to work with uh, the executive in a manner uh, that would uh, allow us to be able to mobilize very critical funding without some of these unnecessary expenditures that have historically been our problem. 
So when you have a, 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 a reduction of available funds and you know that you have to target that spending to, to, uh, to job creating uh, policies and programs, then everybody sits up and agrees that, hey, you know, all these, all these things that the Mr. President has been doing, uh, that we need to key into it and we need to give, uh, you, we need to make available the resources that are required to fund these programs. So for us, it's really about expediting all the work uh, that has already been going on. And that's very key for us. Right. When we talk about agriculture. Yeah, please go yes, ahead. Please. Okay. When we talk about agriculture, there are two main programs that are, are, are very critical. Number one is within the economic sustainability plan. We're going to conduct the largest land clearing and cultivation scheme in the nation's history. Now, the, the chairman of the Economic Sustainability Committee is, of course, the vice president, uh, Professor Yemi Oshimbacho, who is also the chair of the National Council. So you have the 36 state governors that are consulting with him and his team uh, to ensure that all these federal interventions are getting down to the ward level and that there's a hand in glove fit between the subnational governments and the federal government of Nigeria as it relates to the implementation of these pro programs. So you're going to have a, a land clearing and cultivation scheme with millions of young people being employed uh, to engage uh, in, the, in the reinvigoration of a value added uh, a chain such as cocoa into chocolate, for example, uh, soybeans into vegetable oil. The main vehicle that we're using is a $1.2 billion deal with the Brazilian government called the Green Imperative. I would ask any of our viewers to maybe do a Google search of the Green Imperative for details, but basically how it works is we're going to establish 780 service centers in all local government areas of this federation with the $1.2 billion. In 632 out of those 780 centers, we're going to be manufacturing or assembling and uh, maintaining agricultural mechanization equipments because we recognize that if we're going to compete with Vietnam and all of these other Asian tigers, it's going to be because we, we have enhanced our, our production volumes, we have enhanced our efficiency, and we have enhanced the standard of quality of what we're putting out. And, and mechanization is very critical in that regard. If I may interject you, Yes. If I may interject uh -huh. you, if you say we have done all that we can, in your words, how are these policies now being pursued on a local and state national level such that, you know, those that you're targeting, you mean to target those, you mean to get this information, are getting the right information and getting access also to all of these things you've mentioned? Yes, thank you very much. That, that's why it's very critical. You know, I mentioned that, you know, the, the, the vice president chairing both the NEC and the ESC puts him in a position now to make sure that we have the buy-in of the state government. So, for example, the program that we're doing with the massive clearing and cultivation for cocoa and all of these other dairy, beef, and all of these other value chains that have not been developed over the last few decades, uh, that has to do with state governments providing the land. Right, so the state governments are providing hectorate of a hectorate of land for us to be able to to do this project. So they are actively involved in terms of recruit and employment of our young people. It is going to be at the base. It's going to be you know a community by community, local government by co uh, local government exercise. Uh, for example, the national public uh, special public works program is being conducted by the national directorate of employment, and that is going to be 1,000 young people from every single uh, local government, and that's separate from the land clearing and cultivation exercise I'm talking about. So for us, it's very clear. It's very key that we reach the grassroots and all of our our, and all of our, uh, you know, uh, uh, employment efforts uh, in, in relation to the economic sustainability plan and the implementation of the $1.2 billion uh, green imperative. But I just want to mention before I go mm -hmm. that aside from the service centers uh, on the agricultural mechanization, within the green imperative, you also have 148 uh, agro processing centers that are going to be established around the country that will now finish all these raw materials that we have been exporting. You know, Africa has always been known for exporting raw materials. We want to export value added finished products so that instead of using our, our hard earned forex on importing these items, we will be earning forex by exporting these finished products. And that's very critical for us.